So um, I introduced myself very briefly before. My name is Ricky Burdett, and uh, together with Philip Rother and other colleagues, run the Urban Age Analysis Cities. Uh, and in my introduction this morning, I have two tasks. I want to introduce the structure of these two days, and I want to pick up on what Paul has just been talking about, which is what the theme of shaping cities is about. Uh, can I make sure that those of you who want to hear me in Italian, uh, please use the uh, headsets which are being provided. So um, we've heard from Paolo Baratta that the exhibition of Aravena is about understanding certain processes, architectural design processes from around the world. And this image that you see here uh, on the screen, which is the poster effectively for uh, Aravena's exhibition, International Architects Exhibition, is of a German archaeologist, uh, a picture taken by Bruce Chapman, looking, getting up on the steps to be able to see the landscape and understand the world better and bringing back the information collected. It's a very powerful image. This image is behind what the exhibition that Paolo described, which is to bring back, in a way, the meaning of architecture with social and environmental realities and how they confront them with ingenuity. All you need to do is go outside this wonderful structure uh, and walk around this part of the Biennale, let alone the Giardini and the rest of the Arsenale, and see a project saved by Norman Foster, or right in front of us, a floating school uh, by Kunle Adeyami, who will be speaking tomorrow, uh, to begin to understand what it means to have design ingenuity. This is a floating school which was actually constructed in Lagos to deal with the problems of that city. So it's very much about understanding the social dimension, the social implications, impact, as Paul has just called it, of what design means. What we've done, and I'm sorry that we've taken uh, this wonderful photograph and slightly distorted it, is use exactly the same image, the same metaphor, but to understand and bring to this table here uh, the, on what is happening in terms of the dynamics of cities. Either cities that 70, 80 percent, as Joan Claus will tell us and others in more detail later today, which are growing informally, this is a part of Mexico City, or cities which are growing like this, which are being planned, and perhaps not planned very well. So this is exactly what we want to talk about here. And it's all to do with helping construct this extraordinary dialogue that the world is facing about the future of cities in Habitat 3. Now, we've already heard from Paul that the urban age is something that has been going on for some time. It's not just a conference. This is part of it. What starts today is the beginning of a dialogue between people and with 25 people at the LSE and many others, of course, in uh, the Gesellschaft, we work together to do not just these events, but to do the sort of research that you see there. I'm going to quiz every single one of the speakers on these figures by the end of the conference. Uh, they're inside this here. Now, we were fortunate this time to be asked to do two things. We were asked not only to hold the conference, but also to do an exhibition. And effectively, round the corner uh, in the Arsenale, as you go out here and turn left, you will be able to see the exhibition that we curated very much around the themes, conflicts of an urban age, which to a degree are self-explanatory, but much more importantly, will be talked about here. Let me talk briefly for a few minutes about the structure of the two days. Much of what you need is in this wonderful little program, yellow document, which if you haven't picked it up, please get one at the break in a moment. Uh, what you have in it is the detailed structure of the next two days, but also some other information. Let me just cover a few key points. It's a two-day event, and we hope you'll be here for all of it. Uh, you're allowed to leave momentarily, but we want you back. Uh, and it's important to have your participation throughout. We'll see in a moment that we've organized the program around six core sessions and around core themes, three each day, and then we have coffee breaks and lunch breaks. Uh, some of you, uh, as you know, there's an invitation process and um, you will be able to take part of that. We're so happy that there are so many of you in the room that we can't possibly feed all of you 
but those of you who are invited are very welcome to join us. This event is not just uh, being attended by roughly 400 or even more people in the room, but by those who are following the whole um, uh, conversation live streamed in English and in Italian, so welcome to all of, the, of you who are outside this room. The hashtag, as you see, is up there, so please use it to uh, tweet your thoughts and comments. Uh, if you need any help, just ask one of the stewards or one of our team who has one of these things around their neck, but in yellow, who are around you. The simultaneous translations I've already talked about, they're two different channels, but one key point, and this is really said to all my colleague speakers, we're being translated as we speak, so speak slowly. Get excited, but make sure that someone can understand what you're saying and take it slowly and make sure that someone is there and can understand that. And when you have finished with the headsets and you go out, please leave them uh, outside. We haven't asked for your documents. We trust everyone in the room. Make sure you leave them there and don't take them home. Now, we have more than 40 speakers from 25 cities from five continents. How on earth do you manage that? Well, what we really do, and I'm going to come back to this, and all my co-chairs will do this, is please keep to time. We've all learned that actually you can say the same thing in 10 minutes and it takes 30 minutes to say. So not only the core speakers, we've been talking about that for several weeks now, uh, but we want to make sure that even interventions from the floor are succinct and to the point. We're not going to read out people's extensive CVs because in the central pages of this document you have um, a summary of the major sort of background of the individuals who are speaking and in fact all of you who are participants and you can look that up. The conference is divided into keynote speeches from here, panel discussions at the table in front of you and some sessions we will have time for an open discussion <coughs> asking you from the floor uh, to contribute. <clears throat> I'm sorry. When that happens, there will be stewards with the yellow t-shirt with roving microphones. When we ask you to speak, can you say in one line who you are? One line, not your biography. Uh, and uh, please ask a question. Don't make a statement. If you make a statement, we have ways of dealing with that. So. Now, for the speakers, we also have uh, another mechanism which is very, very simple. We have a big yellow card which says, two minutes, one minute, stop. Uh, because that's the only way to ask you all to keep to time. So don't take that personally. Uh, Enrique Pinaloza, who's the best speaker in the world and who enthuses everyone, we have to do it as a sort of sport to make sure he has only one minute left. But unfortunately, he will probably be to time, uh, so it won't happen. But do bear that in mind. I don't want to go through the program as a whole, but there are six themes I'm going to return to. As I say, in, we interrupt for lunch, for coffee, and the, we end each day just before six o'clock, uh, which of course is when the Biennale ends. We are very fortunate, as you know, that Paolo Baratta and his team has actually offered all of you the chance of actually seeing this great exhibition. And when you have time, uh, but not while the conference is going on, Please go and see everything. So let me talk in the remaining minutes about the theme of shaping cities. Shaping in English is both a verb and a noun. And actually, that's quite significant. It's not just a linguistic device. We are talking about who decides the verb of how to shape cities, but we're also interested very much on the shape of the city. What is that artifact? What does it look like? but what does it do to the inhabitants and, of course, what does it do to the environment? So let's just take some of those themes. Who shapes the cities? We'll hear in the first panel a lot about the voice of the citizen or the absence of the voice of the citizen. Many cities, including Barcelona, have elected mayors. Other Colau is here. We're delighted. But so has Rome recently elected mayors who represent, in many ways, those who have not represented the voice of the city. We have Abdul Malik Simon, who in this elegant and beautiful quote he will be talking this afternoon, also reminds us that it's not easy to identify whose voice is being heard. And therefore, actually defining, describing, 
talking about whose voice needs to be heard and understanding that is just as significant as just having this sort of great statement that we have to give voice to the community. But then the urban age is interested in the shape. This is an image of Mexico City. And you see different shapes. You see the shape of the new city, this new typology. It's very identifiable. I don't even need to point out that that's the new city. And then you see the city as non-planned, the informal city. People just get on with life and just uh, do. What does that actually mean? And what does that mean when large percentages of the city will come back to this a lot, especially in Africa, parts of Latin America less so, are growing in completely uncontrolled ways. What form of regulation do we need? Maybe not this one, but this is a reality. It's a reality, and it happens to be in China, it could be elsewhere. This is a private village where everyone owns a share, effectively, in this place, which is a sort of uber-gated community. Now, that is a public space. I can imagine it would have no ball games allowed. Right? Because in a way, the design of the space works against the notion of togetherness, tolerance, and difference. In the work that we've done, and you'll see that in the exhibition and in some of our documentation, we focused a lot on mapping change. And all this map means, and is important to remember, is that in the darker green areas is where urbanization is going to be most intense in the next 20, 30 years. And you can see where it is. It's in Africa, it's in China, it's in Asia, it's in those regions of the world. Latin America has slowed down. Europe and North America have actually stopped, or in some cases, think of Eastern Europe, think of Detroit. Uh, it's actually gone the other way. A fundamental issue we'll be discussing later, and again tomorrow, is what is the nature of this growth? And the work done with my colleagues and friends from NYU, the Marin Institute, the Lincoln Institute, is absolutely fundamental and new in this. Because, just look at these numbers. Out of 160, 86 cities, the population has grown nearly three times, 275%. But the spread, the footprint, the amount of space that's actually occupied is much, much larger than that. It's nearly five-fold. There's one city, Guangzhou. Where does it stop? Well, that's the extraordinary statistic that you see there. It's a city whose population has grown 1,000%, but its footprint, 3,200%. That's what we're talking about. Think of the impact in terms of travel distances, the environment, and all. This is not the only way to go, but this is one way in which things are happening, as you see in a city in Africa, informal growth eating up the countryside, unplanned. This is exactly the same impact but planned, and how these decisions are taken are significant. Population growth and cities is fueled particularly by population uh, growth, natural birth rates, and by people moving into cities. But all of us are aware that the environmental challenge is actually pushing more and more people into cities, which are more and more dangerous in many cases because they're even more exposed to risk. In Europe, we're now facing an agenda that we all understand. And one of my colleagues will be talking about the effect of the migrant city, the different city, on the dynamics which happen within them. Turning to the last few points of my presentation, I want to just focus on an issue which is very much at the heart of what has been said already this morning, which is density. Basically, if you look at where cities are going to grow in the next 30, uh, up until 2030, and you were to choose that all the population were to either develop at the density of Hong Kong or Los Angeles in 2030 in the whole world. If you went Hong Kong style, you'd occupy northern Italy. If you went Los Angeles style, you'd occupy the whole of Europe. Just think of it in those terms. That's what we're talking about. And there are choices in terms of design. Many new cities are designed with this sort of language, which you see on the right-hand side. This is what they feel like. Can we talk about that in ways that can be understood and processed in terms of their dynamics? And this is where architecture and design comes in. All of tomorrow morning, we will be talking about the top-down, bottom-up approach. This is a famous image of the great architect with his hand, his male hand, 
determining what should happen to the center of Paris, thank God it didn't happen, uh, you know, is the same thing happening in Africa today. Let's talk about that as we go ahead. And these are realities that we can see anywhere in the world. This happens to be Istanbul, etc. But this exhibition of Aravenas that Paolo has talked about shows that there is ingenuity and dynamics which come from the other end of the scale. It doesn't mean just small, but the work done in Medellin, for example, the water uh, cisterns and their use and much else in terms of public space is significant. And the work of one of our colleagues, Julia King, on effectively adding sewers and toilets shows the incremental effect of how you can work and retrofit buildings. But you can also do this at the level of the city. In fact, Tessa Jao, who was Secretary of State in the UK during the Olympics, very much oversaw the fact that London also retrofitted and changed. Addis Ababa is doing the same, Addis Ababa, sorry, is doing the same in terms of retrofitting itself with public transport. Mumbai is doing it in not such a subtle way in terms of actually adding new housing, but also what you see there is social housing. So there are ways of doing it, and this is exactly what we want to do in trying to influence the debate. These are the questions that we're going to be discussing in the next few days, and we'll end with a session at the end of tomorrow where maybe some of these questions can be more fully discussed. Let me end by reminding us of what this means. It's not the first time that cities have faced growth. 200 years ago, 150 years ago, many cities grew slower, not so fast, but did grow from millions to tens of millions. New York City grew, but with this extraordinary grid. Now, just look at this. This was the great plan by the commissioners of New York City, who were not actually architects. But it was completely changed to add this thing here. Right? What is the defining feature of the city? It's Central Park. But it's actually a plan, that is my point, which actually has adapted to the needs of the contemporary city. And perhaps Barcelona, in many ways, in a positive way, shows us that a plan of 1859 has also been able to adapt and change. But not everything is perfect. And in a moment, we will hear from Ada Colau that the city which has been able to sort of put itself very much on the map, bring young people there, has also created problems on the other side in terms of too many people, perhaps, or too many people who don't have the same um, interests. And different organizations going back to digitalization have an impact on that. So, this is very much an intent to give you an overview uh, of what we are going to talk about and the structure of the day. So thank you very much for listening and could I please ask all the panelists for the first panel to go to the center of the stage. Thank you very much.